If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 is going to be our text for this week. Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament. It's the third gospel. As you're turning there, I'll tell you a story. About this time last year, we were traveling to grandparents for Christmas, and the kids were in the back seat watching a movie, and Jill and I were talking about all kinds of things on our 10-hour uh, jaunt to Texas. And one of the topics that came up was our full set of China. And we have 12 place settings, plus all the serving pieces that we received back when we got married. And I made the comment that we've been married for 20 years and maybe used it once or twice. And I, I made the comment that the only thing that keeps me from sticking it all on eBay is formal wear. It's kind of one of those things that you pass on to the next generation. Well, Jill made the comment that she's anticipating that someday she will inherit her mother's china from the 1950s when she got married, and also her grandmother's Royal Dalton china from the 1930s. And so for the next 30 minutes, we talked about silverware and stemware and antique linens. It was a long trip, you know. Well, the next night in Dangerfield, Jill's parents treated us to the movie, and the kids wanted to go see The Hobbit. And if you're not familiar with The Hobbit, it's the prequel to what? The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, you know, it, uh, Tolkien stuff. So basically, the storyline, if you haven't seen the movie or, or read the books, is you've got 12 dwarves that are on a quest and to reclaim the lost dwarf kingdom of Erebor and, and the riches of the people that have been captured and held hostage by the fearsome dragon. What's the dragon's name? Smog. Yeah, that's right. And so the journey is going to take them through wild and treacherous lands where they're going to encounter goblins and these awful creatures called orgs and, and giant spiders. And the only problem is the dwarves know when they arrive there that the dragon is undefeatable unless they've got a hobbit who sent the dragon in familiar with. And so they, they've got to find a hobbit to help battle this ferocious beast. So the movie begins in the Shire, which is this beautiful countryside where the hobbit, Bilbo Baggins, is visited by this wizard, Gandalf the Grey. And he's there to enlist the last member of this expedition. Well, Bilbo tells Gandalf that he wants no part of any adventure because... Adventures are nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. And besides all that, it makes you late for dinner. So he tells him, no, I'm out. And so that evening, as Bilbo is enjoying a, a nice evening meal, he's interrupted by the 12 dwarves that kind of barge in and take over the place. They empty out the cupboards and start eating. They even start rearranging the furniture. One of them grabs a, a, a doily and says this Kleenex has holes in it he goes well no and so they're even making fun of him singing this goofy song to tease him uh, chip the glasses and crack the plates that's what Bilbo Baggins hates and so after dinner when they've enjoyed this big feast at Bilbo's expense they sit down and start talking about business and talking about the quest before them and when they start telling about their plans for killing the dragon and what Bilbo will have to do he grows faint, and he asks for a chair to sit down. So as he makes his way into the chair, here's what Gandalf said. Bilbo, you've been sitting quietly for far too long. Tell me, when did doilies and your mother's dishes become so important to you? It's less than 24 hours since I'd had that conversation with my wife. I wasn't prepared for that line. In fact, it was like a gut shot and just a sucker punch. And though I've always viewed myself as kind of the adventuresome type, willing to go and do just about anything, oftentimes my actions tell a very different tale. I don't remember much of the movie. I remember just kind of doing some introspective thoughts and just asking myself, when did I become so domesticated? I blame Jill for that. But... Uh, have I, like Bilbo, become so intent upon building a good and safe liar, uh, life in the Shire that I have for all intents and purposes abandoned or removed myself from the adventurous journey that God calls each one of us to live? 
you know, when we talk about matters of faith, usually it's an, it's an inner, in, you know, intellectual pursuit, and we're, we're talking about different things, and sometimes it's an emotional thing, and, and sometimes it's a spiritual conversation. And yet we look at the Gospels. Jesus was always calling people to go and do. It wasn't just talking about matters of faith. In, in fact, he says we're supposed to love the Lord our God, not just with our heart and with our soul and our mind, but also with our strength. It's an active thing that he's calling us to. So let's read about three would-be disciples and what he calls them to do in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Sounds good. Jesus replied, well, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, um, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, well, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. You know, from the mid-1960s to the mid uh, 1970s, led by their famous coach, John Wooden. UCLA Bruins just own college basketball, if you're, you're up on, on history and stuff. And uh, three of Wooden's national championship teams were led by his uh, best player, Bill Walton, who went on to become one of Wooden's best fans. But at, at the time, if you know anything about the history, they didn't exactly get along. In fact, they had a lot of clashes. Because Wooden was, was this conservative Midwestern and a deeply devout the religious man. And, and Walton kind of was a hippie type that grew up on the West Coast. In fact, um, you know, flower child. And in the summer, he followed around the Grateful Dead. I mean, that's, so you had these two worlds that are colliding here. Well, Wooden had very strict standards for his athletes. If you were going to play on UCLA's team, he had different uh, things that he expected his players to do. And one of them was to keep their hair short two inches or shorter, and, and no, absolutely no facial hair. Well, one fall, as they're coming back to school and getting ready to start practice, Walton comes back in with long hair. He hasn't uh, got a haircut since the spring, and he's also sporting a new beard. And Wooden walks up and said, Bill, have you forgotten something? He said, Coach, if, if you're talking about my long hair and my beard, uh, I, I think I should be allowed to wear it. Coach Wooden said, well, it's unacceptable, and I can't let you practice today. Well, Bill was kind of ready for this, and he says, but Coach, I'm the All-American Player of the Year, and we went undefeated last season. Besides, I think it's my right to wear my hair this way. He said, you're correct, Bill. You do have the right to not cut your hair and to not get rid of your beard but I also have the right to determine who gets to play for this team. And we're really going to miss you this year. You know, in, in some areas of our life, we have to realize that we don't set the terms for the agreement. We don't set the terms and, and can't negotiate what happens within this relationship. And that's what I think this Luke 9 text is, is telling us all about. Jesus is all an invitation you have three people that are coming up saying I'm interested in this adventure that you're putting it on but then turn around and try to define and set the terms for what this journey is going to be about so the first thing that we need to realize is, is, is if we're talking about joining this grand adventure that God's calling us to first thing we have to realize is God's adventure has no room for half-hearted recruits people are just going part the way you know, I, I know Jesus comes off as kind of rude in this passage. I mean, doesn't he? I mean, but the context is everything. Because they're coming up onto the road saying, I want to partner with you. I want to walk with you. But what's this road that Jesus is on? It's no ordinary road. If you look at verse 51, Jesus has started heading towards Jerusalem. I like Eugene Peterson's version of this in, in the message. When it came close to the time for his ascension, he gathered up his courage and steeled himself for the journey to Jerusalem. 
So Jesus is mustering up everything within him. And he's, he's, he's trying to rally. So he's having to deal with his day-to-day interactions with people and teaching people and healing people and doing all these things. But he knows where he's headed. And so he's got to, got to kind of get himself uh, pumped up and ready to go because he knows the road in which he's going on has a cross at the end of it. That's where he's going. And these other people are asking to join him. And, and he wants that. But not if it means they get to set the terms for the partnership. You know, Luke does a masterful job of kind of pulling us in, doesn't he? I mean, because you, you read these three different situations, you're like, yeah, that's kind of how I want my relationship with Jesus. That, that Jesus throws some things out and we say, that's good, but this, that, that's kind of the, the, the grand picture and that, that's in best case scenario, but I've got some very specific things going on in my life, so I've got to tweak it a little bit. And and so we get sucked in and say, well, that's reasonable. Well, that makes sense to me. You can catch with them later. Just tell me where you're going. Maybe tie some ribbons on on, on the trees, and I'll catch up on down the road. Jesus says, no, thank you. I'll pass. Rick Ashley puts it this way. We want the person. We don't want the path. We want the crusade. We don't want the cross. Half-hearted discipleship is Jesus without Jerusalem. It's wanting Jesus only so far, a discipleship that doesn't get too radical. And Jesus says, that's not what I'm calling you to. I'm calling you to give everything. See, Jesus was never so desperate for recruits that he was willing to lower the bar for his expectations. There was no negotiating. Yeah, how can you negotiate if you're asking to join on a road that's heading towards a cross? And this man is willing to give up everything. And he says, I want you to be my disciples and do the same. How do you kind of tweak that? If you're going to wear the label disciple of Jesus Christ, I'm a born-again Christian, you've got to make sure that you're doing just that. I had a friend in high school that really wanted a Camaro Z28 when he turned 16. It was kind of a lofty ambition. Uh, but he had a big poster up in his room. He even carried a Z28 keychain even before he had his driver's permit. This is what he wanted. It was his dream car. And lucky for him, he had a wealthy grandfather that accommodated his wish, sort of. His grandfather got the Camaro part right, but he didn't get him a Z28. And so even though he got a brand new car, my buddy was disappointed in what was out in the driveway. Well, his dad, kind of understanding both sides of this, came up with a solution. He took the Camaro back to the dealership and had the body shop put on Z28 decals and badging even the right hood scoop so it looked just like a Z28. It looked fantastic. My buddy was happy. The only problem was instead of a 5.0 liter L69 V8 under the hood, he had a... He had a a 2.8 liter V6. So it was the only Z28 in Dallas that would go 0 to 60 in 22 seconds. I mean, that's just the way it was. So I learned a valuable lesson in that story. And, and just because the labeling is there, it doesn't mean that it's right. And what Jesus is confronting with this first person is that you can't follow Jesus halfway. The second thing we need to realize about God's adventure is God's adventure has no room for part time participants you know I I think sometimes we start people off on the wrong foot we we kind of present the whole Jesus story and we share all of it and at the end of it what do we do we ask them to accept Jesus well the only problem is Jesus never did that he didn't say well this is who I am and this is kind of my teaching so are are you going to accept that no he says I want you to follow me I want you to follow me it's a big difference See, I can accept Jesus and his teachings. And and nothing really has to change in my life. I can accept Jesus and pretty much do my finances the way I've always done my finances. I can accept Jesus and with my career, it can remain business as usual. Same thing with relationships. Jesus says, if you're going to go on mission with me, it's going to be costly. And life as you know it right now is going to cease to exist. See, putting anything before the cause of Christ, Jesus says, is idolatry. 
Let's take a look back at this text, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. What was the first disciple? What was his idol? I, I put that it was predictability, knowing all the details. You know, first he comes and says the right thing. Jesus, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. But I'm asking, there, I imagine there's some follow-up questions to go along with that. Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go, as long as I'm home by 9 o'clock. And if I'm not going to be home by 9 o'clock, I, I need to let my wife know where I'm going to be staying and, 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 and when I'll return. And I, I've got some vacation days and, and a few sick days. Jesus says, stop, stop, listen. God's creatures have more permanent dwellings and, and, and more permanent lodgings than God's son. They have more routine in their life than what you're going to have with me. If you're going to do, be joined this kingdom of adventure, you have to learn to trust me in all that you're doing. You just give your life over to me. That's what he's asking. I think sometimes we do the bait and switch with people, don't we? And we talk about the Christian life, and we're trying to convince them, if you'll just come and give your life over to Jesus, your life is going to be easier. Where do we see that in the text? Jesus says, if anything is going to be more difficult, there's going to be strife in your family if you come to me completely giving your life. You start living radically for me. He said, in fact, you may lose your life because of this. After all, I'm heading to a cross. For some, this just uncertainty is just too much. And they say, I've got to take a step back. Well, the second disciple, his idol was security. And on surface, it makes sense. He asked, can I go back and, and bury my father? And it seems like a reasonable thing to do. But here's the problem. We have to look at the context. His father had not died. Otherwise, he would have, he would have been there right beside him. It was understood in that culture, especially if, if you're the oldest son, it was your responsibility to give proper burial to your father. So even if his, his father had passed or was just on his deathbed, his son would have been right there, waiting there, waiting to fulfill his duties. I don't think his father was dead. I don't think his father was even sick. Basically, what he's saying to Jesus in this passage is, Jesus, let me go home and stay with my father until he dies. Let me go home and make sure, by the way, that I receive my inheritance. Because I don't know if I leave you right now, if Dad's going to be too happy. If I stay, I'm assured of my land. I'm assured of my place in the family business. I'm assured of my inheritance. I'm insured, assured of my security. By his hesitancy, it cost him the adventure. By his hesitancy, it cost him the kingdom. Remember in, in 1 Kings chapter 19, you've got the whole story of Elijah. He's just had the great victory up on, on Mount Carmel, and Jezebel, the wicked queen, is after him because he's killed 450 prophets of Baal. And so Elijah goes off, he's on the run, and finally he just says, I give up, and he just resigns. He's going to die out there in the wilderness. Well, here comes uh, the Lord, and it, it wasn't in the, in the earthquake, it wasn't in the wind, it wasn't in the fire, it was in the whisper. God says, Elijah, what are you doing? He's like, well, everyone's left, I'm the only one left that's been faithful. He goes, no, I, I've got some other disciples that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. So he gives him food to eat, and then he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go find someone to help you, an apprentice, if you will, that can, in the short run, help you get through these days, but after I take you back, we'll fill these shoes with these sandals, as the case may be. So Elijah thinks this is a, a, a good thing to do. And so as he's heading into town, God reveals one of the first people he comes across is Elisha, the farmer. And Elisha's got his big plow out there with two oxen and yoke there. He's going through, and so, yeah, that's him. So he goes up, and he taps him on the shoulder, and he says, Hi, I'm Elijah the prophet. Uh, the Lord is kind of asked, would you be willing to be my helper? Here's what happens in 1 Kings 19 and verse 21. So Elisha took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people around him, and they ate. Then he sent out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. That's the wholesale changes God's calling us to do. He says, uh, th this whole outer scaffolding that we put around to protect ourselves this planning for the future this this security his earnings all that was gone he's like my livelihood we just ate for barbecue 
And, and there's no going back even if I bought more. I, I burned all my equipment. I have no future here. My future is with the Lord. Where are we going? I don't know. That's okay. I'm with you because I know you're a man of God and I'm going to be with the God as well. That's what he's calling us to do. The third disciple whose idol was family. He says, let, let me go back and run this past mom and dad because I, I don't want to leave without getting the family blessing on this. Jesus hates bargains. He's also always rejected the notion of kind of delayed obedience. Because see, delayed obedience, putting it off to another day when, when, when things seem to be, when, when I finally get caught up in my finances, when, when the kids are gone or, or when, when my health returns or, or when this happens, and this, then I'll be ready to faithfully serve the Lord. See, delayed obedience has always meant disobedience. Young man sees Jesus, feels convicted that he's the Messiah, but he's not ready to commit. He's been offered to go on this adventure. He said, I just can't do it now. Maybe later. I'm sure when he returns home, he still feels this conviction in his heart. And maybe he responded to the Lord in a different way, just different than what God had put on his heart in this. Isn't that just like us? Don't we kind of do this? If you think about it, the Holy Spirit convicts us in one part of our life. We're, we're reading in a text and we're like, oh, okay, that, that just cut me wide open. God, that's what you're wanting me to do. And so we, we, we start looking at it, and to make changes, it's going to require radical things going to be done differently in my life. We take a step back and we say, oh, ho, ho, maybe I'll sleep on this. Maybe these thoughts will pass because I really don't want to live in that radical a way. And so what do we do? We start negotiating. And we say, God, let me ramp it up in another part of my life that you haven't been convicting me on. Maybe I'll read more in Scripture. Maybe I'll go uh, work in the children's wing for a, a few Sundays and, and until this guilt passes and I kind of get back to the swing of things. So we've tried for far too long to define what it means to be a, a, a disciple of Jesus and, and just kind of laying out our life and sprinkling a little Jesus on it and, and drafting a contract, turning around, passing it across the table saying, Jesus, will you please sign on this in your blood? Jesus said, that's not what I have in mind. In fact, this whole life that you've concocted and dreamed up, I want you to drop your nets and come and follow me. Everything that you've mapped out, everything that you have around you to protect you, drop them and follow me. He hands us another contract, pushes it across. He says, sign your name. But Jesus, there's nothing on here. He goes, I'll fill in the blanks. You'll learn to trust me. And away we'll go. You know, part-time discipleship does more than just rob us of the adventurous life that God is calling us to live. It also robs us of a story worthy to pass on to our children. Gary Hagen from the International Justice Mission that works around the world trying to rescue young girls in the sex trafficking industry, he wrote this as, as kind of a thought process that drove him to begin this ministry. He said, after we pour into our children all the good food, shelter, and clothing, after we provide them with the great education, discipline, structure, and love, after we work so hard to provide every good thing, they turn to us and ask, why have you given all this to me? And the honest answer for me was to say, so you'll be safe. And my kids look up at me and say, really? That's it? You want me to be safe? Your grave ambition for my life is that nothing bad will happen. I think something inside of them dies, and they either go away to perish in safety, or they go away looking for adventure in all the wrong places. We have to have a story large enough to give them for their lives. Last week, our daughter Maggie started reading a book called Kisses from Katie about an 18-year-old girl named Katie Davis. I don't know if you're familiar with this book. Katie went two years ago at Christmas break with her youth group up in Nashville. They went over to Uganda and, and just went on a short-term mission. But while Katie was there, she fell in love with the people and saw the great need and felt in her heart that God was calling her to come back and minister and to help these people. 
So Katie returns home, tells her parents, and against their wishes, she breaks up with her boyfriend. She puts all of her college plans on hold for that May, and she sells her car and her clothing, and she moves to Uganda, not knowing the language and only knowing one contact there. Her parents were against it, but she said, I'm going anyway. In the last year, she has adopted 13 little girls and has established a ministry that feeds and sends hundreds more to school and teaches them the message of Jesus Christ. My th first thought when Maggie was telling me about this book was, well, go ahead and read about Katie. But don't you get any ideas? I didn't say that, and I'm glad I didn't. The more I begin to think about it, no, Maggie, go where God calls you. Live into a story that's big enough for your life. Because the third thing that we need to learn about the adventure is living God's adventure is what life is all about. There's nothing else. We need to model for and encourage our children that living radically for Jesus is big enough to give their life to. If you read the Gospels and the story of what Jesus was doing, Katie is not living a radical way. She's just becoming a disciple and doing the things that Jesus did. She's walking with the Master. In the movie The Hobbit, Bilbo Baggins asked Gandalf the Grey, if I go with you, can you promise that I will come back? Gandalf replied, no, and if you do, you'll never be the same. You were born into the rolling hills and little rivers of the Shire, but home is now behind you. The world lies ahead. In Luke chapter 9, it closes apparently with three disciples that look at, at what Jesus is offering and this adventure that's put before them, and they take a step back and say, it's just too much. But Luke chapter 10 starts with 72 that say, I'm in. 72 that are willing to stand up and say, pair me up with someone else. I'm going out to do kingdom work. I'm, I, I, I've lived enough of my life to know this is what I want to give my life to. This is the adventure. Completely following Jesus. And they go out. And it's incredible. Fully trusting in the Lord. So the choice for us this morning is, is really faux safety of a well-constructed life or the adventure of a lifetime. I don't know about you, but I choose the adventure. You know, perhaps this morning you're ready to, to join your life with the Lord. And it's interesting because baptism, really, like the adventure that Jesus is inviting to be a part of, requires us to go all in. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to everything he's asking? I promise if you do, you won't regret it. Perhaps you've, you've joined with Jesus, but... You're looking at your life and, and you're saying, well, my discipleship has been anything but radical. I'm, I'm more like Bilbo. I spent far too long in a chair. The call is there for you again. He's saying, join the adventure. Take up your cross on the road that I've walked on. I can't promise you safety in this life, but you'll never be the same. And so you're, you're thinking, oh, okay, I, 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 what, what am I supposed to do? Why don't you begin with the song that we sang earlier and just say, Lord, I'm available. Lord, take control. This morning, if you're ready to answer that call, ready to join the adventure, we ask you to come this morning as we stand and as we sing. If you say go, we will go.